Well, um, I'm going to attempt to preach this morning. <laughs> I have to be honest with you, I am uh, mentally and emotionally tapped. Um, it was amazing to sit and worship with you this morning, though, um, and hear the words of truth sung over this congregation. But um, we gather together in God's name, in Jesus' name, and we worship a God that is in control of all things. And so um, even when there's uncertainty and difficulty, and when the rain comes and the wind blows, we, we know we are in good hands. And so we're going to turn to him this morning collectively. Does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, Thanksgiving is my favorite week of the year. I, I start planning for Thanksgiving well in advance. My wife has made me a binder of all of my recipes. I cook dinner. I have an outline. My sister is just like, what is all of this, you know? Uh, and so um, I am so excited to be able to talk about Thanksgiving this morning because it really is one of my favorite times, not just because of the food, which can we all admit, we're like, we need to stop eating. Can we just admit that this morning? We need to just stop eating. I, I do. I know I do. Uh, but as I reflected on Thanksgiving, I, I was reminded of what I think is one of the dirtiest words in the English language. In fact, all of all the dirty words I could think of, and I know all of them, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how, I just know. Uh, this is probably, in my opinion, one of the worst uh, words you could ever be called. It's so bad that it will cause you, myself included, to get defensive in an extremely uh, potent way. And, and even as I bring it up, I, I think that you might feel a little, you know, like a little bit of that. It's just a horrible, ugly, ugly word. Do you, do you want to know what it is? Okay, careful. That word is ungrateful. There is a specific reason I've determined that this is a really ugly word. There's a reason that when this word is associated with us, we get really defensive. Because to be ungrateful is actually really difficult to detect. Right? You can't see this one in the mirror very easily. Because most of the time... We don't feel ungrateful. I don't know anyone who blatantly refers to themselves as an ungrateful person, right? Have you ever met anybody and you're like, hey, tell me a little bit about you. And they're like, I'm really ungrateful. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen, right? Because we don't feel ungrateful. So when someone says this to us and calls us this dirty word, so when someone accuses us of being ungrateful, we feel this need to defend ourselves. I'm not ungrateful. I don't feel ungrateful. I mean, the truth is most of us are pretty grateful. When a person is kind to us or someone is gener generous to us, we feel grateful, don't we? we? Very few of us would ever think of ourselves as being ungrateful to those around us. But while we feel grateful or we think we're grateful, there happens to be this separation between thinking and feeling grateful and being seen as ungrateful. So I want to show you what, you, what I mean. There's a passage in the Bible that includes Jesus, that he kind of points this out in a very subtle, nuanced way. So we're going to look at this passage. So if you haven't done so yet, you can open up your phone, the YouVersion app, follow along, or you can turn with me to Luke chapter 17 in the scriptures. Now, most of you probably spent Thursday celebrating that major holiday that we as Americans call Thanksgiving. And while Thanksgiving is more of an excuse to eat inordinate amounts of food and watch too much football and eat more food, the real purpose of Thanksgiving is to remind, be reminded and give thanks for the many blessings in our lives. It's not intended to be a one-day event that we do that, but it is intended to be an intentional day where we are reminded of how grateful we are or ought to be. And in this passage, I think that Jesus helps us better understand what it looks like to not just think and feel grateful, to actually be seen and known 
as a grateful person. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 12. That's where we're going to start. Here's the story. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance. So just a little context here, okay? So Jesus is traveling between the area of Samaria and Jerusalem. If you don't know the context there, those two cities weren't friends. They were civil, but they weren't friends. Uh, those who were part of the Jewish uh, life and community in Jerusalem saw Sumerians as sort of half Jewish. They were half breeds, if you will. They had intermarried with many other cultures and religions. And so there was this constant conflict between them. And Jesus seems to be okay with entering into both communities for obvious reasons, as we know from the scriptures later. But along the way, as he's continuing towards Jerusalem, he encounters 10 lepers, which would have been commonplace between cities. At somewhere along the line, you would find communities of diseased people, of lepros, especially. Leprosy was very contagious. It still is to this day. We don't really see it in America, but in third world countries, you may see it. And it was this deadly disease. And so afraid of causing an outbreak, Lepers would be forced to live on the outskirts of the cities so that other people wouldn't contract the disease. People would be assigned to bring them food and clothing, but otherwise there was not, there were nobody that was allowed close contact with someone who had leprosy. You were to stay away. In fact, in many cases, lepers were required to carry a bell and ring it whenever people came near them so that they could notify people that they were a leper and stay away. Living among other lepers, their lives were not envied. Now, in addition, because of their condition, lepers were not allowed to participate in the temple functions. They were deemed unclean in the Jew by the Jewish law. And so lepers couldn't bring their tithes and their offerings to the temple. They couldn't offer sacrifices for their sins, thereby condemning them. According to the Old Testament law, they couldn't worship God in the temple. They were outcasts, disposed of on the outskirts of society. Verse 12, I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to go on. It says, as he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance. Notice they stood at a distance. Why? Well, that was required of them. And they cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Now, first off, the lepers are clearly aware of who Jesus is at this point. You know, Jesus' reputation has preceded him. They've heard about Jesus. They heard about his miraculous healing powers. And so they want what Jesus has. And they're crying out to them from a far off distance, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Come and heal us so we don't have to be outcasts any longer. And then Jesus says a really curious thing. He doesn't say, you're healed. He doesn't go near them and be like, okay, let's talk about this. What's going on? He just says, go show yourselves to the priests. And that statement is a bit loaded. For starters, it was rare, but it wasn't totally uncommon for someone to heal from leprosy. But if it were to happen, the first move of that person would to be go back to the temple priest. And they would go through an entire process of cleansing, a ritual of sorts, and then the priest would deem them fit to re-enter society and participate in the temple functions. If you were healed from leprosy, your first move would be towards the temple. But a person with leprosy would only do such a thing if they knew they were already healed. Nobody in their right mind would think, well, you know what, maybe if I just start walking toward the temple, I'll just, the leprosy will go away, Right? Nobody would do that. that. That's ridiculous. And yet this is what Jesus asked them to do. He's telling them, I want you to walk in faith that you will be healed as you approach that temple. I want you to take the first step in believing that I can truly do this in you. And so he tells them, I need you to go to the priest at the temple. And what he does 
is exactly what happens. Verse 14, he looked at them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. Now notice, notice what it says. How many? One of them. Not 10 of them. Not three of them. Not nine of them. One of them. For this one leper, he he noticed what Jesus had done, and his first reaction was not to continue to the priest. It wasn't to stop by his parents or friends' place. No, for the one, he goes back to Jesus. And this is what happens, verse 16. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan, hated, right, among the Jews. And Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? That's a loaded statement, by the way. And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go, your faith has healed you. Jesus almost seems a little perplexed here, doesn't he? Like, what gives, man? Just one of you? I mean, he knew, he knew how many lepers were healed. He knew how many started walking towards the temple. He was there. It was like Jesus was saying, wait, weren't there 10 of you? Where is everyone else? Now, before we start judging the nine other lepers, which is like, yeah, where were they? Let me just shed some light on what's bring, being brought up here, because Jesus very subtly is bringing them to an important piece of what it means to be people who don't just think and feel gratitude but actually are seen as grateful people, right? So if you were to have gone to those nine other lepers and you were to ask them, aren't you grateful that Jesus healed you? What do you suppose they would say? Absolutely. Of course I'm grateful. I mean, look at me. I can, I can live a whole new life again. I'm so grateful that Jesus healed me. They would probably tell you the whole story and they would praise Jesus' name up and down. And when the priest asks them, how did this happen? They'll tell him, this guy, Jesus, he healed us. He told us to just start walking and he healed us. And don't miss this because they would think and they would feel grateful for what Christ had done for them. Now imagine if you went to those nine other men and you started accusing them of being ungrateful. They would immediately get defensive, right? And begin to tell you, we're not ungrateful. I'm so grateful God healed me. In fact, they might say, I told the priest all about Jesus and how grateful uh, you know, I am. I told my friends about my family and, and how Jesus healed me. I even told the lady next door, look at me. I, you know, I, we can have dinner again or whatever. Like, like, I'm not ungrateful about this. But while they were telling everybody else this story, Jesus was standing with the one saying, weren't there 10 Where are the other nine? Here's what I want you to hear more than anything else today. I think this is what Jesus is trying to pull out of this story for us very subtly. He's pointing out to us in this passage that unexpressed gratitude actually expresses ingratitude. Right? Unexpressed gratitude it actually is seen as or it expresses ingratitude. The truth is, it doesn't matter if you feel grateful. I mean, that's nice. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, feeling grateful, thinking I'm grateful, it's not who we are. We are people who are seen and known as grateful. I mean, that statement makes me wonder if God often feels the same way about me and you. We may be telling our friends and our family and our spouses how good God has been to us. We may be telling other people how good God has, you know, how God has healed us and forgiven us and saved us. But God is saying, weren't there 10? Right? It's not that we don't feel grateful. It's that we haven't expressed it to our God. I mean, genuinely expressed it to him. Maybe ask yourself this question. Do you think that there are people in your life, this is more of a horizontal relationship we're talking about now, people in your life who feel this way about you? 
where they actually see you as ungrateful. And if they, if they told you, you would get immediately defensive about it. I am not. Ungr- I am grateful. But they see you as ungrateful. Why? Because you don't express your gratitude. You got to say something. You got to come to the feet of Jesus and express like the one, thank you. Thank you. I am so grateful. I mean, we know, look, we know we should express our gratitude. We just, we do, right? If you grew up in a home, you were probably told at some point, what do you say, right? (laughs) Thank you, right? But when we don't actually do it, it comes off as ungrateful, right? And if you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, right? (laughs) Kids, I'm sorry, but you're the worst at this. Actually, you're not the worst. Adults are the worst at this. They really are. But when you're, you know, when you're a parent, it's just, man, it just grates on you. I'm just telling you, it just does. But that's the reality is like even within a, a father-son or a father-daughter relationship, even though my daughter or my son may feel or think grateful, until they express it, it actually looks like they're ungrateful, doesn't it? <laughs> Somebody's really happy I said that. I don't know. Maybe a little too happy. But here's the thing. Expressing gratitude, saying the words, having that moment with a person with God, it does a whole lot in the relationship. And the one thing that it does that I've noticed is that when expressed gratitude happens, it starts to breed more gratitude. Have you noticed that before? When people, you hang out with a really known grateful person, you'll be grateful for everything. You do, you're just like, I don't know why I keep saying thank you. I just hang out with this person, and I'm just so grateful. It's like it breeds greater gratitude in us. When our kids were little, uh, we started to notice this trend after dinner time. We would eat, and then the first thing our kids would say after their, mayor is they, their meal is they'd say, can we have a treat now? Right? And I'm like, dang it, no, right? And I remember on one occasion, Christian and Kristen express to them how they seem really ungrateful for the dinner they received and when they all they can do is ask for a treat immediately after they ate and the kids like all of us got defensive right we're not ungrateful we're really grateful we just want a treat right (laughs) We're, we're thankful mom for the dinner give us the ice cream come on right They weren't ungrateful, they just didn't express it. But for us, it came off as ungrateful. So we instituted a new rule at the table. You ain't getting any treats, not leaving the table until the person who made dinner has been thanked for the meal. Forced gratitude. That that is is the recipe for success in your home, okay? Parenting 101, forced gratitude, right? But here, here's what I noticed. Something happened. (laughs) Man, I should really do a parenting series. That'd be amazing. (laughs) And I noticed something happened, right? So after the meal, one of them would realize, oh, we're supposed to thank mom, we're supposed to thank dad. And so they would thank them. And you know what happened next? The other two did the same thing. And it was genuine, right? It wasn't like, oh, thanks, dad. Can I have a treat now? It was genuine. It was like, thanks, dad. And then it bred this other gratitude. Like it breeds a home of gratitude. When we become grateful people who don't just think and feel it, but actually are known for it. Uh, The second thing that expressing gratitude can do and will do is it generates greater generosity. I mean, don't you find it easier to be generous to people who express their gratitude? It's really easy, right? Expressed gratitude is the magic recipe to generating more generosity, It is so much easier for me to give my kids what they need and what they want after they have expressed their gratitude for what they have. And I don't have a stipulation on it. There's no ultimatum. I'm just saying it's naturally more easy or or easier to be able to give and be more generous with people when they're grateful. It just is. And I think the scriptures would hint at God is very similar 
He talks about consistently that, look, when you worship and you praise me and you, you thank me and you, you come before me, it's not an ultimatum. But man, for those who understand what they have, I am so generous to give more, more responsibility, more uh, influence, more uh, ability to use the gifts that I've given to them. If all we do is take and receive everything and I do that with the people in my life, I do that with God, eventually it becomes more and more difficult for us and the people around us to be generous. Expressed gratitude generates generosity. Here's the last thing it does, and this is, don't miss this, okay? Expressed gratitude glues relationships. It is, I believe, the glue in any important relationship. If you are in a relationship with a person who has, does not have the ability to say thank you, my guess is it's miserable. It just is. And if you're that person, stop. Say thank you. Just do it. Forced gratitude, okay? Just do it, right? You know, in my example of asking a child, you know, what do you say, right? Like, what do you say? Not only is a parent asking their child to say this to simply prove, hey, he's grateful or she's grateful, but they also know that it is a glue that holds relationships together. When gratitude isn't expressed, it leaves relationships unresolved. And if you leave a relationship unresolved for too long, it starts to crumble. It starts to fall apart. Unexpressed gratitude can be a relationship killer. If you serve your friend, your family member, your spouse in some specific way, but they choose to never express gratitude, even if you're not looking for it, after a while, the relationship starts to fall apart a little. I mean, maybe you've been in a relationship where you have felt taken advantage of, you have felt used before. Do you know why you felt that way? A lack of gratitude. And oh boy, I hate to say it, but we've done the same thing to other people. We've been on the other side, and we've watched relationships in our lives crumble because of our own lack of gratitude and willingness to express it. But I'm telling you, you be in a relationship with a person, in a marriage, in a friendship, in a family relationship, and you're in a relationship with them who expresses their gratitude to God, to you, it glues you together in a way that most things can't which is exactly why I believe the Bible constantly tells us not to just think grateful thoughts or have grateful feelings, but the Bible tells us time and time again, give thanks. Because it glues our relationship with God together. I'm just going to read a little bit from the scriptures. I could sit here for probably a half hour and read you only a small portion of the ways the scriptures invites us to give thanks. Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Say it with me. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Psalm 7, 17. I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Ephesians 5.20, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. We are not people, kingdom people, as kingdom people, we are not people who just think or feel thanks and gratitude. The Bible says we are to be people who give thanks generously, to be known for our gratitude. Because unexpressed gratitude, it only expresses ingratitude. And it is not who we are called to be as people. It applies in our earthly relationships, our expressed gratitude, and it also applies to our heavenly relationship with our God. And as we take time to give thanks to God, it gives way to another level of gratitude toward him. And as we express our gratitude toward God, it generates generosity in our lives. 
I mean, I'll just be honest, the most stingy people in life tend to be also some of the most ungrateful. And the most grateful people I know tend to be the most generous, wouldn't you say? I mean, there's, I don't have any statistics to back it up. I just kind of live life like you and I see things. And that's what I see. God is a generous God. And throughout the scriptures, God desires us to be the same. He wants us to be abundantly generous with what we have been given. And as we see from Luke chapter 17, God is abundantly generous with those who express their, their gratitude. And he's calling us to be the same in this world. Now, lastly, and maybe most importantly, and as I mentioned, when we choose to express our gratitude to our God, it glues our relationship with him together more closely. Our expressed gratitude, giving thanks, praising him, waking up in the morning and talking with him first and foremost to say, God, thank you for this life that you have given me, for the blessings in my life. Thank you for loving me the way that you did. When we do that, it glues our relationship. We draw closer to God as he draws closer to us. There's so much to be grateful in this life. And especially to a God who's expressed his love to us through Jesus Christ. And I just wonder, have you told him lately? Have you given thanks for what you have, for what's available in him? Let's pray. Father, I, I am humbled this morning, carrying just some of the heaviness of the news uh, that we shared earlier, but Lord, I, I want myself, this church, to be known as a grateful people. And Lord, I know as I read, you know, wrote through this and studied this, it just became very abundant to me clear that I, I spend way too much time feeling grateful and very little time expressing it. I pray that you would change that in us. That, you know, the, the world around us, the people we work with, the people that we interact with on a daily basis, our family, our friends, we would be known for a lot of things and that one of them would be, man, they are grateful people. You know, sometimes we forget, Jesus, what we have in you. And so I pray that this morning you would remind us that as we head toward Christmas, we're reminded that you came for us. That we were dead in our sins and you came for us. While we were still sinners, you came to heal us. You came to bring freedom. You came to change us from the inside out that we might see change in the world around us. May we wake up each day May we go to bed each night reveling in the love and mercy that you've shown us, expressing our gratitude to you. May we do the same with the people around us. May we never let a thank you go by again, but instead that we would be people that express gratitude who are known as grateful people. And so this morning, God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his death upon the cross, his sacrifice. We thank you that he didn't stay in the grave, but he, was rose. he rose again three days later. We thank you for the new life that he has given us. We thank you for this place you call the church, imperfect people coming together, shouting your praise, thanking you, showing gratitude. God, we pray that you would glue us together as a community in gratitude, that you would glue us closer to you through gratitude, that we would never be known as people who are ungrateful because we cannot stop expressing our gratitude. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.